very few of them succumbed which is great but it does mean there's going to be a lot of people built up who are going to be very susceptible to any uh, new virus that comes along welcome to the fat emperor podcast i'm your host ivor cummins Hello all, it's May 28th and I'm going to give an update on some of the figures and data around the impact of this current viral issue, primarily focusing on Europe. And I'll also look at the latest evidence, uh, published evidence, on the efficacy of lockdown and what it delivered over smart basic distancing measures, uh, which you would say, of course, makes sense. So before we go ahead, just to remind people, this will pass and there will be vastly more deaths from heart disease and heart attacks in the coming years than ever occurred this season with the coronavirus. So I'd encourage you all to go to extratimemovie.com. That's extratimemovie.com and stream or download our new movie on stopping and reversing heart disease. And I think you'll find it quite fascinating. So anyway, on with the data. So here we have Europe all-cause deaths, which we get for previous years from Euromomo, uh, a register of all the deaths and the variations from the expected deaths. So I'm going to show the graphs now, and it's 15 to 64 years old and over 65. And there's no real impact whatsoever below 15 years. Most of the impact in the upper graph here is actually from people above 50, uh, but they don't have that category. So you'll see here in 2018, right, which is late 17 into early 18 is the season for, you know, respiratory diseases, influenzas and excess mortality. You can quite clearly see over what would be expected in the normal season. And we have that for over 65s as well. So this is the excess mortality from the database. And if you add up all of the excess mortality off the y-axis, you find out we had around 20,000 excess deaths in the 15 to 64 group and around 120,000 approximately in the over 65s. So we essentially had around 140,000 excess deaths in the 2018 season. Now you'll notice in 2019 there was very little extra death uh, so it was a very mild season and also in 2020 or late 19 early 20 you know the winter spring season uh, there were almost no excess deaths and this is important because all of the people over this year year and a half who would be susceptible to influenza type or coronavirus type impacts very few of them succumbed which is great, but it does mean there's going to be a lot of people built up who are going to be very susceptible to any uh, new virus that comes along. So now we see the spike here, and that is coronavirus coming in. And it's certainly a high spike, very sad, tragic, uh, overloaded hospitals, as we've seen. Uh, but again, the reason it was very high and sharp was very much to do with all of the susceptible people who did not succumb in, in these mild seasons to date. So that's the sharpness. But you also see it comes down uh, very rapidly. And we'll look at another view of that in a moment. But I can't integrate or add up the death rate here because these figures uh, are not as accurate in the last week or two. So what I did was I took all deaths from coronavirus in 2020 from worldometer so we're missing nothing here in fact many of the deaths corona would have been put down when there were many other conditions present you know comorbidities so certainly we're not undercounting here and it is 24th of may data this so you can see here that 140,000 excess deaths in 2018 and um, so far, we have 161,216 in 2020, and they're driven primarily by, of course, corona, because we're not seeing any other influenza-type diseases in this season. It's really just corona. So there's the compare, and it's probably going to be reassuring to people that it's certainly very severe and very concentrated in time. But on a wider perspective, it's not quite maybe what the panic would indicate over the past few weeks. Now, we also need to look at where the curves are. So Europe is not finished yet. That is true. So we can see here that Europe peaked around early April 
and then has been falling down steadily since with some country variation but broadly that's the shape of the trend and it matches pretty much all previous uh, viral pandemic trends um, it relates to you know immunity whether it's first phase immunity innate immunity or whether it's second phase or adaptive you know that's a factor and many factors change it's quite complex but we see the curve here so that's europe and just because Sweden is so topical, we see here that Sweden is following a very similar curve. And, you know, there are many countries that in mid-April started dropping their lockdown, putting kids back to school, and the curves don't shift at all. They continue on their exact cycle. So we're seeing that all over uh, Europe at this point. So there's a compare, always the same curve shape as I discussed with Professor Levitt a couple of weeks back. And uh, this is just the way it is. So people might say, yeah, but this year we did lockdowns and we changed the curve. Well, let's look at the evidence now for lockdowns, because you could say this year would have been vastly worse than 2018 if we had not done lockdowns, etc. And I'll talk in later podcasts about how that's quite a misleading belief system uh, based on the history of research on pandemics and published papers. But let's go ahead and look at the logic for lockdown. And don't be put off by the, the detail here. I'll just read through it quickly. So it's a very important engineering tool that when you get that on an issue, you add up all the evidence for and against your belief system or your hypothesis. If you don't put it all on one sheet, you get bias and favoritism towards evidence that supports a hypothesis. And maybe you subtly ignore some of the evidence that's uncomfortable. And this is very dangerous in terms of rapid resolution of issues in complex systems. So we have always used the evidence for against table, and it's probably the most important table of all. So the evidence for, if we look at assuming lockdown after some deaths have occurred, i.e. the virus is prevalent in society, which was the case all across Europe. It had been running free from January to March. Well, a lockdown after the virus is well around. That's what we're talking about. And we can see here UK's lockdown was in late March, where the first cases were identified in January. And France and USA are, are similar. So lockdown ahead of smart distancing like say Sweden did how effective is it well let's look at the evidence so the evidence for it would be said that the cost benefit of lockdown is advantageous i.e you save more lives than we will cause issues deaths and suffering for people by having a lockdown so it's kind of a for philosophically but it's highly questionable because the costs of lockdown are not being quantified at all really. So we've got cancer diagnoses missed in the UK. I think they're down a factor of four from normal. So a lot of people with stage one and two will actually be picked up at stage three and four. And there's a massive difference in mortality when you're late with cancer diagnosis, as you can imagine. Uh, cardiac issues missed, uh, livelihoods destroyed, obviously, enormous unemployment, and there'll be depression, suicides in the coming six months. Uh, substance abuse, effect on children, you know, their education impacted, families impacted, mental health generally. There's the evidence for or against, you know, just to think about philosophically, but let's get into the actual. So the evidence for it would be said is that some country compares associate the lockdowns with lower rates or falling curves. Against that, though, many or most countries do not associate the lockdown point with lower death rates. This is associational data, so we can't say much about it, but there's for and against in this particular vector. Now, you could also say that specifically selective, highly selective associational compares suggest a benefit. So you could say Seattle that did the most early and most lauded lockdown, it had 0.07% death per million or overall population death rate. And New York, which had a disastrous uh, sequence, as we saw tragically, and that they had done almost no lockdown and the subways remained open, they had a 0.16% population fatality rate. So even this four data is a bit unusual because 
the city that did things dreadfully compared to the model city, there's only a doubling in the debt rate. But if we look on the against, now we've got rich data. There's countless state and country compares where there is no association with lockdown. And I'm just pulling one out here. Illinois had an early lockdown in mid-March, shut everything, stay at home orders, just when the deaths were starting. And it ended up with a 0.037% overall death rate. Florida, just to pick an example, had a very late lockdown, reluctantly at April 3rd when they were well into the curve, uh, yet they only had 0.009% fatality rate. So four times lower for the least lockdown state compared to the most. So you can see here that again, it's associational, but there's really, there's no evidence here for lockdown. So the rates seem to fall in places associated with lockdowns. And one of the reasons for that is the lockdown went in as the curve was on the rise and you had huge amounts of infection around the place and you're going to go through the viral curve. However, the lockdown doesn't necessarily have to do anything because the curve is going to follow the natural curve in any case. But it is being put forward as evidence that there's an association with the timing of lockdowns loosely. But against that, we now have data, quite a bit of data. The rates are shown in many, many countries to have fallen the R value right down towards one before the lockdowns went in. And the Koch Institute in Germany is one example who did an analysis. And basically, they were right down towards one. Then the lockdown went in and then it stayed around one afterwards. So almost no impact. And Sweden's R curve, you know, we want to get the curve down. It's almost exactly the same as the UK's, even though that was lockdown versus no lockdown. The two are practically superimposed. In fact, Sweden's R began to fall rapidly in March uh, down towards one. And it's kind of stayed there since, similar with the UK, give or take. So Professor Carl Hennigan of Oxford many weeks ago uh, was in the news because his team had done an analysis and shown that the lockdown came after the peak. So he demonstrated the lockdown didn't add really anything and the curve stayed the same shape after lockdown following the curve we see in all countries in the Northern Hemisphere. Woods Hole Institute did a full analysis many weeks ago, same thing. They said the lockdown has not linked statistically to any change in the shape of the curves, the R curves. So basically they can't find any impact. Uh, Professor of Mathematics uh, Isaac Ben Israel in Israel uh, four or five weeks ago said that analyzing the data, all countries across Europe, there's a 70 approximately day cycle right, from when it ramps to when it falls, and it's independent of any lockdown, right, timing or data. So he still maintains that, and to be honest, the data largely says that. Professor Michael Levitt of Stanford, who I interviewed a couple of weeks ago, Nobel Prize winner in 2013 for complex chemistry, modeling and progression dynamics, right, so he's the right guy to have. He actually, with his team, noticed in February and spoke to Ferguson in London at the Imperial College and said, guys, you're, you're out by a factor of 10 or more in your predicted impact, because he said from the China data, and then later from the Italian data, you can see that the curve was following a natural path going way sub exponential, very fast. And then it was going to hit a, a peak and come down, right? So he said the exponential model you're doing is wrong. It cannot be right from the real world data. And he went on to do analysis of all Europe and it's the same answer. The lockdown does not link to any significant improvement in the curve, sadly. So the most detailed uh, statistical analysis paper from a large team went through everything again, published around a week ago. And they say that a 30% reduction in rate may have been associated with distancing uh, all the way down to 5% reduction in rate. And maybe lockdown added the last 5%, but the way they've used the data, to be quite honest, is a little questionable, and I think they made some mistakes there. But either way, it says lockdown is a tiny effect, if any. And logic, I'm going to finish with logic, because logic is very important in problem solving. 
And we tend to these days look at evidence-based medicine and data and statistics. But good old-fashioned logic can be crucial. Uh, black swans, you know, hypotheses that have glaring logical gaps. So let's look at a bit of logic. So the millions of grocery workers across Europe and the US, we have the data. Uh, Three million grocery workers in the union in the US, a couple of weeks ago, the data came out with 41 deaths, which is lower even than the average in the US. Now, they are not as elderly, of course, but even accounting for that, it's an extraordinary lack of signal because those guys are non-locked down. They're eight to 10 hours a day mixing with all the people coming in and out. Right? We know the infections were rising right through that period. Nothing happened. Uh, the essential workers across Europe, there is no signal for essential workers effectively in the actual data. They do not have higher rates, certainly of death, uh, or even higher rates of infections. So a little more logic. Many, many countries have dropped the lockdown largely and moved just to distancing. And remember, this is a compare of lockdown that damages and causes destruction versus just smart distancing. It's not a compare against nothing. So many countries have dropped Slovenia, Czechoslovakia, Denmark sent the kids back to school in mid-April. The countries all over the place are basically dropping the lockdowns. And there's lots of reports coming out that they're amazed that the curves are not changing. They're continuing to go on down. And Israel as well completely dropped the lockdown several weeks ago, three weeks ago. And they basically took away nearly all restrictions, opened businesses. And there was even a 5,000 person concert the other day uh, with people heaving together. And the government is holding back. And their curve has stayed coming down and very low, no impact. So the last piece of logic is we know that a high R rapidly transmitting virus was streaking across Europe from January onwards and action was only taken really at the end of March in several countries or mid-March. So smart distancing will flatten to protect hospitals and that made absolute sense. And you know, you don't want to overload hospitals, you want to make sure everyone gets care. But again, even Sweden had over 20% spare capacity with their soft distancing approach, and they never got near capacity and everyone got the ICU care they needed. And of course, all the other countries, except for notable super dense areas and cities and the north of Italy, which has profound vitamin D deficiency and many other challenges. So really the logic says, you can't really get a whole lot out of lockdown once it's all over the place. And the last thing I'll finish with it is there's a paper on this published in 2006, a US paper in the uh, Biosecurity and Bioterror Journal, and it's Disease Mitigation Measures in the Control of Pandemic Influenza. Now, I know it was about influenza, but to be honest, this coronavirus and prior ones all follow similar patterns in any case. So this paper, and I'll, I'll link it below, is a very interesting read because they looked at the whole concept of locking down in a country after a virus had clearly entered the population. And they came out with very strong recommendations that locking down and isolating the healthy does not work in, in all the history of theory. So really, these lockdowns were a completely new phenomenon in 2020. Uh, they seemed like a good idea. They were understandable back when the curve was rising. But the thing we all need to think about is why aren't they gone now that we're way down the curve in Europe and even the US? And just the last thing, here's where we were locking down in March, right? Because the curve was rising. We didn't want to overload hospitals. But the peak occurred and now we're over a month or six weeks on the downside. So the lockdowns intended to protect the hospitals. The hospitals are effectively empty now. So logically, uh, what is the logic for the lockdown to continue or even any strenuous measures? So we'll come back with more, certainly always focusing on the data and the evidence, like logic for, against, uh, and never getting into any conspiracy theory stuff, of course, always science-based, evidence-based. And uh, just a final reminder, yeah, it would really help us support the free podcasts if you share extratimemovie.com, uh, download or stream the movie, and especially share it, because we're going to continue to have enormous 
fatalities and tragedies from heart disease and other modern chronic disease. Um, and it's going to utterly eclipse uh, this year and this issue we've had uh, of late. Although, of course, many tragedies there pales into, into tininess uh, compared to heart disease, cancer, Alzheimer's and all the other chronic diseases that we know we can intervene and hugely mitigate. Thank you. Thanks for tuning in, guys. If you're watching on YouTube, you can see my subscribe button in the middle of the screen. And go to extratimemovie.com to see our fascinating new documentary on stopping and reversing heart disease.